Again, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. And the idea was to reminisce a bit and think about old times as we have this 100-year centennial celebration, rather remarkable landmark when we think of uh, other organizations and how they struggle through 10, 20, 30 years. We're at the 100-year the mark. And when I thought about it, Jack, I, Jerry Jordan, maybe, and, uh, and uh, Boyd were kind of in the 50-year time frame in the early, and Joe in the late 60s, early 70s. And so another 50 years is almost transpired. So a lot has uh, occurred. And so we want to just chat about it a bit. And what I'm going to do since I posed the original questions was, how did you get here? What did you find when you got here? And how it affected your subsequent urological life? I'm, I'm going to start off real quickly. And then uh, in chrono best chronological order, call on you all to, to chime in. So Joe, you will follow me. So my, my story is that when I joined the residency program at MCV, I clearly remember there was a annual or semi-annual uh, meeting of all the urology training programs in the state, which included Urology of Virginia, MCV, where I was, and Norfolk. And what I distinctly recall about those meetings were two things. One, the faculty number in Norfolk were five, the Charlie and Pat and Gene Putas and Bill Times and Joe Fivesh, so five. Whereas there were only two attendings at MCV at the time, and I think three at UVA. So there seemed to be a numerical advantage to Norfolk. And then they also, the other thing was they were focused on subspecialization of sorts, even way back then with reconstructive urology and with Jean Putas, who was the, the actually uh, world famous and renowned renal vascular surgeon. So then I went to Memorial for a fellowship and I was looking for a job, obviously. I had to get a job after that and I was uncertain. So Whitmore said one day, gosh, I went down to the Tidewater of Virginia. You're from Virginia. And I, I met up with the Divine Group and they're a pretty proactive group and they just opened a medical school. So that was the story. I came south again, shook hands with Pat and Charlie and said, I'll be there at the appointed time. And when I got there, I'll just say that one of the most striking things in the first month or two was a business meeting. And I say, I never correlated business with urology. I'd never been to a business meeting, didn't think the two had anything to do with one another. But there I was listening to the usual and customary fees and, and a bunch of other assorted uh, interests points of interest, but what was clear was everything was open, transparent, everybody knew what your know, salary was gonna be and what everybody's income was. There was no hidden, hidden figures. And the major thrust was, we're gonna do what's best for the patient. So it was a very, I'll say, comforting uh, initiation. And then, well, the residents, the partners, the patients, one year became five years, became 10, 20, 30, 40, and now uh, 45 plus. So I've never had a regret, uh, never sought any uh, employment elsewhere. And I can say I'm happy to be here, happy to be there then and happy to be here today. So I'll end with that and ask Joe, could you give us some thoughts about how you got here and what you found and how it's uh, transpired in your urologic life. Yeah. Joe, you, Were you talking hey. to me, Paul? <laughs> um, yes, yes, Joe. Okay. Did you hear what yeah. I, did, did you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't hear very well, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, am I talking too loud? No, you're, oh. I can hear you fine. Okay, well, you know, I kind of grew up with Pat. I didn't know Charlie about the whole thing, but uh, I knew Pat 
very well. We played golf together uh, for a long, long time. And I had contemplated several things when I was getting towards the end of my practice of my residency. One was a job in Florida and the other one was Dr. Paquin, who was, can you see me at all? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. I can't, yeah, well. okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, another one was a job in Charlottesville. Dr. Paquin asked me if I wanted to stay there. And although Alice Jane wanted to stay there very much, I did not. I wanted to come back to Norfolk and to, pack, to practice urology with Pat Devine. So anyway, we came on back and uh, it was a very interesting situation because the, Charlie was the oldest guy in the practice, Pat was second, and Gene Putas had come uh, having lost the opportunity to be head of urology at the Cleveland Clinic. He and I forget the name of the guy that he was having a, a contest with, but that fellow had been an All-American football player at Ohio State. <laughs> and anyway, Gene Putas lost out to him. And Charlie Devine somehow or another knew Gene Putas. I don't know if Charlie had been at uh, Cleveland Clinic at all. Do you know, Paul? I think he did spend some time there, yes. So anyway, uh, as I understood it, it was Charlie that got in touch with Gene Putas, who had just lost the opportunity to, to be the head of urology. And he decided then to come with us. And Gene Putas was a very interesting sort of a guy, as all of you all know. Uh, he was he was not the warmest person in the world and I think that you either felt very strongly that you liked him or you maybe did not like him too much I was one of those that did like Gene Putas we were not bosom buddies but uh, it was all very very interesting uh, listening to him scrubbing with him he was a beautiful surgeon and very quick. And I was more meticulous and very slow. And then Pat was, Pat was the sort of guy that really kind of ran, ran the practice at that time. And he was always interested in anything that had to do with urology. And I remember one time Linda Devine and Pat and Alice Jane Five Ash and Joe went to play golf together at a, a uh, course that was on the, I forget the name of it, it was a great golf course right on the border of Florida and Georgia. And Pat and I- Masters. Huh? The Masters. <laughs> what was the name of it? The Masters. Augusta. Augusta. <laughs> oh, no, it's not Augusta. Not Augusta, no. No, I've played Augusta several times. but this, It wasn't Pinehurst. It was, I, I forget oh. the name. But anyway, we, we got out there and we were playing one day and Pat and I on a, on a uh, par three hole on the backside, I hit a shot up there and it was just about two or three inches off the green on this little hillside. And then Pat hit another shot that was almost hit my ball and stopped maybe four or five inches from my ball. And the first thing that Pat says, we walked up there and he said, you know, you could cover those two balls with a scrotum. And <laughs> that, that was, that was, he was always thinking about something urological. And, uh, but, you know, Pat was the guy who was kind of the, the one that ramrodded things around our place. And Jack, as you remember, he, he thought we should do all of the urology east of the Rocky Mountains. 
Yeah. And right. <laughs> was he felt that 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 we really had should have a huge place in the practice of urology. And I think we did in thanks to those three guys. Uh, and then uh, later on, of course, through Paul and through Jerry Jordan, uh, it, it was a real pleasure and a privilege to be practicing with all of you people. It really was. And, you know, Bill Tynes died about a year ago. And as I understand it, he had renal failure. I went by to see Margaret. Uh, when we moved into Harbor's Edge here in Norfolk about seven months ago. And she said that Bill had gotten to the point where his renal failure was so bad that he really didn't want to live anymore. And so he decided that he wouldn't eat and, and he subsequently died. And this was about, about a year ago maybe not quite a year ago. I, what, I really wasn't sure because I wasn't here at the time. We were at the beach at that time. But anyway, Margaret seems to be doing well. And, uh, you know, I, as like Paul, I enjoyed every minute of the practice here. And I felt it was a privilege to be practicing with such fine people. And I thank you all for everything that you did. Well, Joe, thank you for that. That was a, a real uh, enlightening and comforting set of words that you had. And you mentioned Jack and Jack's uh, interaction with Gene Putas, which for all of us was pretty special and unusual. Jack, uh, your, your turn to give us some of your thoughts. I, the reason I came to Norfolk is I just followed my mentors, which was Joe Five Ash and Pat Devine. They're both trained at the University of Virginia, and that's where I trained. So I thought that'd be the good place to go, and I did. And I want to relate a little story about Dr. Charles Sr. Most of you don't know him, but Joe and I remember him. Remember Dr. Charles Sr., Joe, the guy who started the whole thing? The what now? Dr. Charles Devine Sr., who started the whole practice. Right. Well, he was a true Virginia gentleman. He loved his bourbon. And every, <laughs> every night before he go to bed, he had a little glass of bourbon, a little toddy. And when he came in the hospital, the final time he was sick, he was old in his 80s. And he was in, in the patient room with Charlie and Pat. And Charlie and Pat came out and said, I don't think he's going to make it tonight. I said, why? He won't take his bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately he died the next day that's but he was a wonderful guy he really was he was this interesting interesting fellow and uh charlie divine senior right charlie divine senior exactly yeah yeah so I, I, I remember i remember going into the office where he was in a still behind the desk and he had this little index file with some uh cards in it which contained the entire history of his practice. And so he'd pull out a card and it said, Mr. So-and-so prostate massage or urethral dilation or septra, not septra, just sulfa. <laughs> and then at the bottom, it said $2 or $4. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's it, it, that was his, uh, his Rolodex computer. Yeah, that's, that sounds like Dr. Charles, he was something. Well, thank God for Dr. Charles because he got us all down to Norfolk. You know, we we had a wonderful practice there, and we still do. Although I'm not, I've been out of it so long. I mean, I can't comment on what's going on now. <laughs> oh, you can do that. You still read your journals, Jack? Not the journal of neurology. No, <laughs> <laughs> there are other journals I'm reading, but not that. <laughs> I hey, sure boy, that I left. Boyd, how about you? You came soon after I did, and uh, your turn. Yeah, well, I, I just I know it's out of turn, but Joe Fivash didn't tell the best story about his arrival to the practice. He shared it with me. It may be apocryphal, but it's still worth retelling. But Joe Fivash told me that when he came to the group, it was all divines, and he was the young guy joining up. And there was a consult over at the hospital, 
And he was sent over to do the consult and he went and introduced himself. I'm the new guy in the urology practice. I'm Joe. And before he could finish, the woman said, oh, you must be Joe Devine. And he said, well, I might as well be. <laughs> and, you know, it really does tell something about the practice that for a good number of its years, it was Dr. Senior, Dr. Charles, Dr. Pat, and Julia running the whole show. And even after I got there and when Joe Olivo began to update the business practices, he said there were still files with used envelopes with notes about the patient's record written on the back in you know Julia's handwriting for the business aspect of the practice and uh, you know when you think about how it ran along on such meager beginnings and is lasting a hundred years it is an amazing phenomenon I um I don't feel like I'm an old guy yet but it's really amazing to me that I got there shortly after the first half century. Paul, you must feel the same way too. Um, you know, we've seen half of the life of this really amazing practice. Um, we heard some stories about Dr. Senior. I, I'm probably the youngest of the crew who actually met him because he passed away in between the time I came and looked at the practice and before I finished my residency and got to join up. Um, I got to Norfolk because I was trained at the Mass General by Dr. Hendren primarily. There were other people there, but I was really, I was Dr. Hendren's you know, protege. And Dr. Hendren was very solicitous of his trainees for the rest of their lives, as long as they moved more than 600 miles away from Boston. <laughs> and so, you know, Norfolk just made it. But Dr. Hendren got invited by Charlie and Pat to come and be a speaker at one of what they called the wet clinic. And you guys all remember that. There were, there were lecturers, but then there were, we would see videos of what was happening in the operating room. And Dr. Hendren was the guest and he said, Boyd, you should come with me. You should meet these guys because your wife's from Virginia. And uh, we came down to Norfolk and stayed at the o Omni Hotel. And uh, it was the last day at lunch when Dr. Devine walked by and Tr Hardy reached out and said, Charlie, I want you to meet my resident, Boyd. He'd like to come down here and work with you. <laughs> you know, well, there was no application or any of that stuff. And I thought, wow, a wing and a prayer. And about three or four weeks later, Paul, you called me and said, boy, you were down here and we haven't heard from you yet. So, you know, we set up another meeting where I came down and I got to deal with the wonderful Judy Zirkel, who another yes. one we've lost recently, but Judy was just the sweetest person. And she said, would you like to stay at the Omni? And I said, you know something, that's very nice of you to offer but my wife has an aunt and uncle in Norfolk, Chappie and Spike Thrift, and they want me to stay with them. And I think that sort of helped the process along that I had ties to the area and wanted to be there. But I'll tell you, it was a wonderful 14 years for me. In a, in a lot of ways, I regret that I got attracted to Richmond, but I really had to because Mary's mother had become a widow and we were spending every evening driving up to help her find her car keys. And it just wasn't a good working situation. Um, but, you know, I lost a lot when I left Norfolk. I lost a children's hospital. You know, Richmond claims now they have one, but they don't. They don't have anything like that. And the camaraderie of our group where we actually went to each other's homes. I, I got to tour the Lynn Haven River and Paul's Boston Whaler, and we were always out at Charlie's or Pat's. I've never found anything like that again in urology, and I have to admit it. Um, I haven't had a bad career, but I'm really glad it's kind of over. I, <laughs> at this point, I've retired from full-time practice, but I do baby circumcisions two mornings a week at a, at a outpatient surgery center that I'm a part owner in. And if I want to keep getting my, my dividends, I have to do something there. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I do a little bit going and it's, it's great. And it makes me remember that I used to be a doctor. 
Um, just like Jack said, that when my emails all come in, the first things I throw away are all the urology things. <laughs> yeah, I look at yeah. YouTube's. I look at YouTube's about how to take apart my lawnmower and put it back together. That's that's the kind of thing that interests me. I'm I'm maintaining several acres here, and I, I I just finished heat stripping the paint off my back porch before it gets screened in. So I'm healthy and active, but doing very different things than we used to do in urology. Well, you you but, look healthy and you sure are active. And I well, need a little, I need a lawn that needs mowing. I need, so. I need some heat stripping on my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, Florida, you got work ahead of you. Yeah. yeah. We well, we have a house. Our house, our, house was, yeah, our house was built in 1870, oh, wow. and when we bought it, the previous owners, delightful people, they dressed it up for the market by putting a new thin layer of latex over the last probably hundred years of paint and I'm taking it back to the wood. Um, in, someday somebody will thank me many decades <laughs> from now. But I, <laughs> we'll be around for that. Yeah. Hey, well, yeah. Boyd. Yes, Boyd, sir. It's Joe. I apologize for not writing to you, but I never got any messages from you uh, when, when William died. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 I would have done it uh, in a heartbeat. Well, that's I, never, our, you know, I never got any messages, well, so but please excuse me. I knew it was a difficult time, and of course, I know your daughter and your that grandson who, you know, I've seen, so, you know, I just hope they're making it okay. Um, you know. Well, you look great. You look like you're really uh, enjoying Richmond, and how's Mary getting along? Mary's fine. She's down in the library playing solitaire on the computer as she <laughs> usually does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Boyd looks like the chief resident at Bo at Children's Hospital in Boston. Maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. a senior chief resident, but not much beyond that. You know, we were all talking about Gene Putas. I formed an immediate bond with Gene Putas because we had a Boston connection. He was always really good to me. And after he retired and moved to Wintergreen, um, his wife talked me into looking at a place at Wintergreen. And I don't know how he knew. He, he had a lookout on that road through Lovingston that leads to the mountain road. But I was driving by and I got a call on my phone. It was Gene Putas. He said, I see you're coming up to Wintergreen this weekend. Come on down to my place and I'll teach you how to make a dovetail joint, which, you know, has to do with That's his he made table stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know his, his wife, his wife was the sheriff at Wintergreen. Yes. That's why, yes. That's why she knew what was going yeah. on. She yeah, had they, scouts out they had a lookout. They could recognize yeah, yeah. the cars coming through. <laughs> Gene wanted me to come and learn some carpentry tricks from him. You know, and regarding his surgical technique, I mean, he was a very amazing surgeon, a bit was. more cavalier than I was used to. But there's a story about Ted Felderman. You mean, Ted Felderman, one oh, of our yeah, residents, right. fancied himself to be a protege of Dr. Putas. And Dr. Putas let him dissect through the flank and expose the renal hilum. Um, it was a renal artery aneurysm. And Ted got it all done. And Gene looked at him and said, you feel pretty good about yourself, don't you? You think you're hot stuff. And Ted said, well, no, sir. So Gene took the scissors and just took them and nipped open the renal vein and the wound filled with blood. Oh my God. And he said, Ted, now fix what you've done wrong. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, that I sounds would, like that sounds like Gene. He, yeah, he we're gonna, edit, we're gonna edit that out. Of him. Of him. <laughs> he just did whatever the, whatever the hell he wanted to do, he did. <laughs> That's know? right. He didn't we'll edit that, that out. Of <laughs> <laughs> Don, can you uh follow in now because you're the next in chronological order? Um, well, I, I came to Divine Five Ash Putash Urology from a little bit more roundabout way. I, I, uh, I joined the group formally in April of 1993, but I had had a previous relationship with the practice when I was the chairman and program director of the Navy hospital program over at Portsmouth. I was there from 80 to 83. Uh, left the active Navy in 83 and joined a practice in Danville, which at the time was uh, uh, 
probably, can you hear me okay? I'm getting a yes, signal sir. here. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you're, you're coming so through, I, yes. Okay, so far. I joined the practice in, in Danville, and, and at the time, they had a close relationship. They had had an independent urology residency and then merged with the uh, Chapel Hill residency. And uh, we had, uh, the agreement was that uh, uh, we had two of their residents, a chief and a junior, all the time in Danville. And when I got there, because I guess of my previous experience, I got tagged to be the uh, residency coordinator for the Danville site. And, and for most of the time I was in Danville, I kind of looked after the residents and, uh, you know, did the program and so forth. And uh, uh, for political reasons, I think at the state level, I don't think it had anything to do with the uh, department. They pulled the residents out of there unilaterally in 1989 <clears throat> and uh, um, without consulting us. I mean, it was just one day, well, you aren't going to have the residents anymore. And so part of my reason for being there disappeared because I liked it. And shortly thereafter, uh, I got a call from Paul. I, I think I was down at a Navy Reserve meeting or something in Greensboro. And when I came home, my wife said, I said, oh, did he say what it was about? And uh, she said, no, but maybe he wants to offer you a job. I'd love to get back to Tidewater. And uh, I said, no, it won't be that. It's probably about some kind of, uh, you know, prostate cancer program or research that he's involved in that he wants to, you know, us to get involved in as well. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, so I called Paul and his first question was, have you ever given any thought about moving back to Tidewater? <laughs> and uh, so as I tell the story, usually to my friends, I, I say, I kind of wrestled with that for several days. My wife wrestled with it for about 15 seconds. <laughs> and, and, uh, and You're breaking up. Don? Uh-oh. I think we lost. Uh, yeah. I guess his audio is going or something. Mike, can you do anything I'm about that? And, uh, and treat the invitation lightly at all, but uh, he's probably doing ham radio with the Ukraine or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Russia. No. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll come back to Don. We'll come back to Don. So, but we'll go on. When Don comes back, we'll ask him to wait until Ed Roby's finished, and then he can resume his story. Ed, how about your thoughts? Yeah. So lots of them. I um, I mumble. So I guess can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I was at Wake Forest in uh, or Bowman Gray at the time, and. Um, medical school. Bill Boyce was the oh, yeah. chairman and Lloyd Harrison behind him. And then Marty Resnick was the junior attending. And um, so it got time to find a place to do a residency. And I knew I wanted to stay in the Southeast. I just felt comfortable doing that. And so I talked to Dr. Resnick and said, you know, and he gave me a list of places and he mentioned Norfolk, which I hadn't really thought about. And so came here and interviewed. I remember meeting uh, Pat Devine and Paul and Bob Huben. May have met Joe Conflow at the time, I can't remember. But I remember Pat Devine reminded me of a drill instructor, which um, seemed like a good, I good idea in one way. And uh, I remember meeting Paul and you know the gentleman that he is and Bob Huben. It's just a great experience, the, in the interview process. and. So then I went back home to Winston-Salem, and I'm not sure how the match happened in those days, but Paul called one day and offered me a spot, and um, so I jumped on that. And then the very next day, Lloyd Harrison called, so I was really blessed that uh, those phone calls went in that order because I'm not sure what, what I would have done otherwise. But that's how I ended up here for my residency. 
So then I went and spent three years with the Air Force to pay for medical school. And um, when I came back, I followed uh, Jerry Jordan and Steve Schlossberg. And, you know, there's no way I was going to keep up with them. The anyway, only way I caught up with them is when they both left. And then I was like, okay, because they, they, they were excellent surgeons as well. Um, but that was a, that was a, and we also had, remember the journal clubs that we had oh, yeah. back in the day? Pat Devine and Charlie Devine's houses, and right. it was like the whole universe of urology. Um, so when it came time to decide where to go, though, after I got through with the Air Force, then I knew that I really liked the group here. Um, I thought it might be in a more rural area. I just was more uh, drawn to that. But I liked the group and I knew the group. And my stepdaughter, Renee, um, has some special needs. And it was a r- rural areas weren't going to work. So I'm glad that uh, that we ended up in in Norfolk. And it, it's just like everybody else has said, it's been a great career. Uh, you know, it's during, for me, there have been a lot of changes over time. It's been stone disease, laparoscopic stuff, donor nephrectomies, back to stone disease, a bit of administrative stuff, and now watching a grandson. So uh, it's been a, you know, it's been a, it's been a bless, blessing all, all along. So. That's what I remember. <clears throat> oh, and the other thing. Oh, so when I ca- got back here, look, I remember looking through charts and seeing op notes that would have Charlie Devine Sr., Charlie Devine Jr., and Pat Devine all scrubbed in on the same case. That must have been a great, uh, a great scene. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. Don, we, we lost you there for a, a minute, or you were then saying you were going coming back to Tidewater if you're if you're still on the line, you want to pick up from? Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I'll just kind of finish it up. I, I What impressed me was uh, I came and, and spent a couple of days with you, Paul, and when I got my car stuck in your driveway, you <laughs> were kind enough to come out and help me push it out. And uh, I thought that, you know, this is a this is a really collegial practice. I, I like the uh, I like their spirit. And when I got back to Danville, uh, Boyd called me on the phone and encouraged me to come. And that impressed me. And uh, I also heard from Dr. Charles Jr. And uh, uh, I spoke also with Jerry. Jerry had been one of my residents at Portsmouth and uh, then had gone on and done the fellowship with, uh, with you all and then come back to us in the Navy for a year before getting out and joining, joining the uh, divine practice. Um, and uh, when I came back, uh, uh, Ed was also very, very helpful in kind of uh, um, getting me settled and getting me oriented to the practice. Uh, so I was, I was very grateful for that. I, um, and then Paul, you and I had the Sloan Kettering background and that meant a great deal to me. And what was attractive was the opportunity to come and uh, be able to practice generally mostly oncology surgery and an oncology practice. I think Sintera at the time was thinking seriously about establishing a major cancer center of which there would be a urologic division. And for whatever reason, that never took off at that time as much as they uh, said that it was going to. But we still had this very uh, vibrant uh, um, urologic oncology practice. And uh, uh, I, I don't think I, uh, the only time I think I worked harder than when I first got here and, and, and got the practice, my part of the practice up and running was when you were out of action there for a while uh, later in the 90s. And I was kind of covering both practices. So it was, uh, <clears throat> it, um, I learned a lot about my ability to uh, extend myself and uh, how much I could do if I needed to. But uh it was also an opportunity to, uh, to, to be a part of what I considered a, a really nationally prominent uh, urology group and uh, uh, practice with a bunch of people that uh, I, uh, I had always, what I liked about the Navy was when I, when I left to go out of town, if I had patients in the hospital, I always had the sense that uh, they were gonna be well looked after by the guys that were still on duty when I was somewhere else or at a meeting or at a conference or something. And, and I always had that feeling in, uh, in the divine practice that uh, uh, my patients would always be well looked after and no matter what bad stuff would happen, there would be somebody there that would be uh, both capable and willing to deal with it. So uh, 
it, it's, it's been a great adventure. I was with the group 25 years when I retired and uh, I don't regret a minute of it. And my wife, by the way, is absolutely delighted to still be in Tidewater. So <laughs> yeah. here we are. Well, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Don, thanks. And Kurt, uh, you're, you're the, the young guy, believe it or not, <laughs> even though you're getting, getting a few years under your belt, you're the young guy. So give us some of your story. Well, first of all, I appreciate being the young guy. It's rare that I'm on a meeting, but I'm the last to go if it's chronologic. So I appreciate everybody letting me that. Um, and I also feel, I feel lucky as heck. I, I had uh, no interest in interviewing in Norfolk. I didn't know, even know where Norfolk was as a medical student growing up in Toledo. And one of our residents um, told me I had to come to, to EVMS and, and match there or interview. And, and when we came, Carol and I fell in love. And uh, I didn't think I would match though, because um, I remember an interview with Dr. Shamra, you and I interviewed on 4K or 5K, whatever it was at that point, sat in a little tiny room. And then I um, interviewed with Steve Schlossberg and he flipped the lights off and he put up an X-ray of a retrograde urethrogram and I had no clue what I was looking at. And Steve kind of was Steve and um, kind of <laughs> pimped me and gave me a hard time. And I I just sat there sh shriveled in my chair and well, okay, that was fun. I guess we get to enjoy Williamsburg for a day and drive back to Ohio and enjoy the, the time. Little did I know um, that I would end up here. And, and it's probably due to Brad and Ken and Miller, in all honesty. They actually um, sat me down outside the hag on a little bench and said, you need to come here. This is where you need to be. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have been here. Huh. Um, I also think, um, you know, we're so lucky to have the residents and all of you, except for you, Dr. Fivash, I never got to work with you, but, you know, everybody on this call, you're living through the residents. Everybody is hearing stories about Dr. Stecker, for sure, Dr. Winslow, and, well, I have to be nice about Dr. Roby, because as hopefully everybody knows, <laughs> Catherine Roby, his, uh, his daughter is one of our all-star residents as a second year, so Yay. they're always really positive That's stories. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's great to hear, Ed. That's great to hear. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm so lucky to be in this practice. I, I never thought I would stay here when I came. And, and uh, when uh, I started interviewing um, at other places, Dr. Jordan pulled me aside and said, you're not leaving Norfolk. Um, you have a job here, which I didn't know about. Um, I do have to give Dr. Winslow some grief because I would have probably been a pediatric urologist if... Uh, he had stayed in Norfolk a few extra years, so I am a little disappointed about that. But I think my I think it turned out uh, well for me. But I mean, it's incredible. I mean, we're we the current um, urology of Virginia. I don't think appreciates all the time how lucky we are to stand on the shoulders of giants, and um, it's really impressive. It is well. So yeah, then Kurt Kurt uh, is now on the board of the American Neurologic Association, and he is an international traveler. I think he's as well known in Africa as he is in the USA, and so hats off to you, Kurt, for everything you've done in that, in that sphere. Yeah, I, as folks have been talking, I go back to Jean Putas just real quickly, because as a resident, we had a, a woman, a young girl with severe hypertension, and it turned out she had fibrous dysplasia of the renal artery. And Warren Kuhn said, you know, what I asked the, the gentleman from, from Norfolk who really knows renal artery surgery. So I, I called out of the blue, called Dr. Putas. He answered the phone. He said, when should I be there? I was amazed. Wow. I said, well, next week at nine o'clock, he shows up at 8.45 with a <laughs> suitcase full of his Smith rings and all his fancy <laughs> retractors. <laughs> and, and the case was well known at MCV and Hume was the vast renal transplant expert. I mean, there were vascular surgeons all over the place and they heard about this and they said, wow, we're going to go in and watch this guy just flummox his way through and, and we'll have to rescue him. They were all, you know, how vascular surgeons can be. They were kind of salivating at the idea. Well, Putas comes in there and we say, we'll help you. He said, no, just just keep your hands aside. He puts in a Smith ring, he puts in the retractors, beautiful exposure of the artery, opens it up, does the end autorectomy, sews it up, 
I mean, he said maybe 30 words during the whole operation. The closes it up himself, closes the skin himself, and then says, give me a call in three or four days. Let me know about her blood pressure. Packs up his stuff and walks out. And I mean, wow. the vascular surgeons were just, I mean, they were slinking out. They didn't want to be seen. You know, they were kind of just trying to hide behind the, the lamppost. And all of us, I mean, we were just blown away. And we said, well, who is this guy? So we run to the library and we open up and Gene Putas, gold black kidney, Gene Putas, renal vascular hypertension, renal transplant. I mean, it was, we were just blown away. And was, Gene Putas wrote an article about de-icing of an airplane, wing de-icing. Well, it, I mean, he, he, was, he was a renaissance man. He well, really he, he fixed yeah, he old was. cars. He, <laughs> he had really a coin was. collection. I remember yeah. he showed me a widow's mite. I mean, a widow's mite is kind of, you read about it in the Bible, but whoever thought you'd see one. It, and then he had stamps. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah, he was an incredible guy, wasn't he? He, 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 he really was. was. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Uh, and then he became a master craftsman woodworking as well. Yeah. 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 Well, throw throw in any other ideas, guys. To we've got a few more minutes. Anybody else want to? If I could, I I want to say something about someday, years from now, people will read what was going on at our hundredth anniversary, and I think it deserves to be emphasized how advanced this group in a place that was not noted to be a center of the medical world. You know, I left the Mass General with the typical kind of myopia and smugness that Boston hospitals have. You know, we just kind of assume, you know, we're headquarters, it's the hub. And when I came down to Norfolk, I had never seen a wound closed with skin staples before. And I made rounds with Charlie Devine and we got into a room where a catheter had to be removed. And boy, at the Mass General, it was a flail. You know, you had to ask a nurse to get a syringe and all that. Charlie reached into his jacket pocket and he had a paper clip that was partially unfolded. And he took the tip of it and, <laughs> down, and, down, and let the water out of the bowl. And it, I mean, he, these guys had it down to the point that everything was efficient and technically just right. Um, it was it was a real eye opener, and <clears throat> I felt so lucky to get to you know come on board where they weren't hobbled by years of tradition. <laughs> they <laughs> they were really moving forward, and it, it it just a great experience. The other thing is the friendliness, and everybody in our group knew everybody else, and you know we were at each other's homes, and that extended to the residency. We. I've never been in a situation where the residents became family as quickly as we did in Norfolk. Yeah. And I think a lot of it had to do with our Monday morning meeting where everybody gathered and they, yeah. they got out talking about the football games that their colleges were in. And I, I one day said, you know, we we're he hearing about Georgia and Penn State. And I said to Joe Fiveash, hey, Joe, Harvard lost. How did Princeton do? And Pat Devine said, oh, come on, tell us about the high schools out on the Eastern shore, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you Notre Dame guys. But, um, mm. and, then, and then our conference where we went over cases, I remember one where Les Akporiai, a really bright Nigerian fellow was sitting there watching and there was a case of XGP, xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. But oh my nobody, God. I've you know, heard that in a long time. Yeah, nobody <laughs> what it was twice in my life. Bye. Yeah, well, everybody <laughs> said, you know, this, this looks really bad. This maybe we ought to do this and maybe we ought to watch it. And all of a sudden, Les said, Excuse me, but we don't actually know what this is yet. And Paul said, you know, that's why we bring in other people. It was, it, you know, it really was in, in education all the way um, and a friendly one with, without pressure. So, you know, I, I'm really grateful for the years I had there. Well, 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 the other well, thing let, I remember. Go ahead, Jack. I, I was just going to say, the, as Ed here, I was going to remember, I was just remembering some things that had little to do with technical skills. I remember being with Charlie Devine 
and him saying, you know, the best thing you can do when you go in a patient's room is sit down. You're not going to be there any longer, but they're going to feel like you're there forever, which I unfortunately didn't follow that advice very much. But those sort of things were, you know, those were great That's skills to learn. The art of medicine. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, um, just to amplify a little bit on what Boyd has said, uh, um, I guess I, I've always had kind of an avuncular bent toward the residents when uh, one of the things that I'm very grateful for is I had the opportunity early on with Paul to work as kind of his assistant program director. And then I kind of inherited the program when, when Paul gave it up in the late nineties. And when Jerry became chairman, I kind of did most of the, the uh, <clears throat> residency program, handled most of the residency program stuff. And, and then when Jerry stepped down as chair, I became the chairman and I was chairman for about 10 years. And my philosophy was always uh, when we were, were looking at residents that I wanted residents like the residents that we had, that were mostly a very collegial, team-oriented, high-spirited, industrious bunch. You know, they weren't a bunch of grinds. They weren't always, you know, the top of the line, uh, um, you know, with the with the highest scores and the, <clears throat> but they were smart, sharp people, and. And they were obviously developed a uh, teamwork spirit where they really looked after each other, and uh, <clears throat> um, and and I've I, you know I I've I've told my kids sometimes that next to your kids the people as a as a person who does academic medicine the people that you find yourself thinking about and caring about the most are your residents and what they're doing and. Man, our life is a lot families easier. Are doing, and if they have illnesses and kid problems and so forth, right. you worry about them just like you worry about your own family. And uh, right. it, it gives me great pleasure when I hear from one of the former residents, when I hear get a Christmas card from Tom Bowie or from, uh, uh, you know, some of the some of the people going way back, uh, Jeff Carney. Uh, Kurt was one of the residents, and I was absolutely delighted when... Uh, the, con the conspiracy was such that they were able to get him to stay here because I think that was a very good move for the practice. But uh, the other issue that Paul raised was, you know, where does where does urology of Virginia stand in the in the constellation of urologic practices? You know, how do you think we're viewed, or how do you think the practice is viewed and the residency is viewed in in the grand scheme of uh, residency training programs? And I'm too far removed from it now. I've been retired from EVMS for 10 years. And I think that, you know, I'll have to defer to Kurt and to Mike Fabrizio to really give a, a, a cogent statement on that. But I always felt when I had the program and before, when I became associated with the program early on when, when Paul convinced me to join it, that uh, the, the EVMS urology residency was one of the best, if not the best, small urology program in the country. And, and I base that on the fact that uh, I got a lot of good positive feedback from residency candidates that came through. I had a lot of colleagues from the military who later went on into academic positions and I got a lot of feedback from them. And uh, I just had the sense that, uh, you know, this practice was always looked up to and that doesn't happen by accident. And I, I think it's just a reflection of the kind of people that were in it when I joined it. Whatever damage I did wasn't so sufficient that it damaged it so badly that it sullied the reputation too much. And I think we were fortunate in some of the selections that we made that we've got, uh, you know, you've got a group of almost 30 people now, I guess 30 attendings you're probably positioned to be uh, able to train residents much more efficiently and much more intensely than we were when I was involved in it. So um, I think the, uh, uh, I, I, I was thinking when, when I put this all together that if Dr. Charles Sr. could look at the urology residency today, thinking about what he may have envisioned it to be in 1922 or whenever he, he started uh, thinking about a practice or whenever the urology uh, residency became a reality, um, I think that they'd be um, absolutely amazed and um, 
appreciative of all that the current group is doing to yeah i would, I would I I, i'd like uh, based on what you said don to have kurt just kind of finalize or close out with the current status of the residency yeah. program and and how it is developed and how the whole practice of education has well morphed uh, through the decades to the current time so kurt can you Give us the cleanup, be the cleanup hitter. Sure, I'll can try. I, can, I one, Kurt, can I say one thing about Paul before, before we finish up? The uh, Just real quick, Paul, I just wanted, the other thing I remember is how personally you took your patient care when things didn't go the way they should have. And that's something that really, I think, gets passed on. And one of the funny stories was one time Dean Clower was doing a case in a room and wasn't so going so well. I was out in the hallway, and I think you turned to me and said, uh, "Am I staffing that case?" <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> sorry, Kurt. <laughs> um, so it's interesting, uh, Dr. Winslow. We still do the same conferences because I thought the conferences were so great when I was a resident. We still do the same thing. Um, I think you know, Dr. Schellinger's and Dr. Lynch's leadership before. Um, when, when we choose residents now, we reach for the best residents, but the other thing we look for is someone who fits in the family. And I truly think that's a huge part of our, our residency. And, um, at the end, I always tell the residents, I want someone who I can sit down five years from now and have a beer with, because if I can't tolerate you for your five years of your residency, you know, I'm not going to want to sit down with you five years afterwards. Um, I will tell you, I think we have, I would argue the best clinical residency in the United States. Um, the diversity of our faculty. Um, we have fellowship trained people in every aspect of urology, more than just one where some residencies don't have one. Um, we have the laparoscopic, the started by Dr. Roby with the oncology, with Dr. Schellmer and Dr. Lynch starting it and obviously expanding. We have infertility. We have more recon people than any program in the country. Um, female urology. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any program that can fit the diversity, the case volumes that we have. I mean, I think we're so lucky to be to be where we are and, and have the residents we did. And I think that was the foresight of everybody before us staying out of the medical school. I mean, uh, obviously, it was nice not to be employed by the medical school and limited to who we could hire and not hire. Um, but I, I truly think it's a it's a family um, atmosphere in our residency. And, and as Dr. You know, Lynch said, it's so awesome and, and to hear about from other residents. And when I when we make decisions, and I'll tell Lynn Vass this, and, and that's someone we should also not forget, right? Yeah, um, yes. Lynn obviously has been around as long as all of us oh. and oh, has yeah. pretty much ran the residency. She's She's gone through five chairmen, I think is what we came up with at one point. And, and truly has run the residency on those years. And, um, when we, when we make decisions, I usually say, what would Dr. Schellmer do? What would Dr. Lynch do? You know, am I doing the right thing it's to make sure we're doing the right thing for the residents? Because if we care about the residents, then the residency will be great. So thank you, everybody. Paul, it's, I want to say that it's great to see you all. It's great to know that everybody's doing so well. And incidentally, I, you may not know about Jean White. Uh, I talked to her about six months ago, I guess, and she was in good shape. Oh, and good. incidentally, uh, Judy Zirkel, I used to see Judy Zirkel uh, fairly regularly. She was living in a kind of old folks home at Virginia Beach near where we were. And she died about, I guess, maybe a year or 18 months ago. Have you, had you seen her, uh, Paul? I, I had seen her. See, yes, that that your your did story you is see correct. Judy? She had a boyfriend. She ended up having a boyfriend in this place, and I think I think yeah. she was very happy. And uh, but it's great to see you all, and and I hope we can do this again. We should do As it Jack again. Jack said, yeah. uh, "Have a bicentennial yeah, right. in another hundred years." Or <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. We're all in. <laughs> we're all in. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hi there. Yes, and I, I did want to chime in just to say um, I'm I, I'm sorry I couldn't really participate much. I was chasing toddlers around uh, tonight, and I'm sure you remember what that's like. Um, but I, I just want to say, I guess, as the representative from the youngest generation uh, now of urology, I think I can still say that 
I'm about six years into practice here, but um, you know, we really are excited about this, uh, this hundred year celebration. I think we all realize how lucky we are to be a part of, of this organization that is the tradition uh, that has built on, on all of the, the work and, and dedication that you all put into your careers and into the organization. And so, um, you know, th I think this is a, a really a big deal and, and uh, a chance to remember uh, who we are and, and build our culture up even stronger, um, whether it's uh, from the academic standpoint, clinically, um, and, and just to uh, really highlight what a special place it is. Um, I'm, I'm not from Virginia. I, I didn't train here. Uh, and, and actually, uh, you know, that's becoming uh, many, many of our new hires really are, are in that same situation where um, they, they did not have any, any ties to the area. But I'll tell you that we all uh, are, are um, uh, you know, excited uh, to, to celebrate this hundred years. We, we, we are, are, are um, you know, really excited about the culture of the place and the, and the chance to continue that uh, and to honor uh, just the, the heritage uh, that, uh, that we were lucky enough to, uh, to be, be joining into. And so, um, you know, thank you all for, for your work on this. I think this was taped and I, I would love to go back and kind of listen to it um, because I did not get to hear too much, but uh, we, have, we have really a bright, bright future ahead. Um, and uh, hope and, and building on the, the great past that we have and that we're talking about. But um, we, we, as Dr. McCammon, uh, I caught the tail end of what he was saying. We really have uh, some incredible uh, folks now and, and the work that, that's being done uh, is incredible. And, and we just want to um, really, and I'm, I've taken over from Dr. Roby, who I think is on and, and uh, as chief medical officer, and I'm, I'm just trying to help facilitate uh, you know, the, the, the great work that everyone's doing. So, but I just wanted to say hello and, and thank you all uh, from the younger generation for, for all that you did and, and what you built here. So when the time came for me to look at urology residencies, I wandered through the, the Northeast and primarily wanted to stay on the East Coast and uh, came down to Norfolk and like Paul was very impressed with the variety of urology that was available. And at that time, you know, the, 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 the textbook Campbell's was not too big. And I was dumb enough to think that I could master the field. <laughs> was I wrong? <laughs> but anyhow, um, I, I went, came back to Boston after interviews. And I said, Carl, uh, I really like Norfolk. I want to go to Norfolk. And, uh, but Char uh, Pat Devine has told me he wants to see other candidates first. And uh, I said, well, but I, I kind of want to get my situation, you know, know, know my plans for the future. And Carl picked up the phone and called Pat. And that's why you're stuck with me. <laughs> Letter that's of the way it was then. Yeah, that was a yeah. no matching that program. Happened. Um, residency, you know, a uh, couple of memories, thoughts, Char Charlie Devine and Charlie Horton. You know, one thing I learned from them, no wasted motion. You know, I mean, meticulous, precise. Uh, but then a little story about Dr. Charles. He, he, loved, he loved photography. And I, I don't know, you know, again, it's one of these memories that just I can't get out of my head. He loved photography and he went to Australia uh, on the invitation of Ross Snow, who was a fellow at the same time that I was a resident. And um, they went to a golf course that, I, that I've been to in Australia sometime thereafter. And in Australia, there's kangaroos everywhere. And I just have, he took Dr. Charles there and Dr. Charles walked onto the golf course and down the hill, taking pictures, totally enthralled with these kangaroos. And I don't, I can see him doing that. I don't, I don't know why that, that, picture image in my mind has never, never gone away. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of strange. Uh, but, but uh, Pat, on the other hand, Pat was tough, but uh, Pat also had a soft side. And, you know, I, I could ask him questions about life and uh, where I was heading and uh, things I should be doing, what I should be thinking about. And, you know, he, he, uh, he was, he, I, I've got to say, 
uh, in spite of the fact that some feared him, he was he was super he was super to me. And one time I asked him, "Why, why, Doctor Devine, did did you did you you think your family went into urology, and why why did you like urology?" And he said, "You know, it's really special taking care of older men who." In general, are easy, excuse me, ladies, I, you can't say this today, but in general, easier than taking care of old women. And it's neat, you know, uh, taking care of older men who have weathered the storm. It's, it's, a, it's a special opportunity. And they do. You know, the old men, they usually had great stories. You know, of course, back years back, we got a lot of stories about the war and, and what have you that, that, that were neat. So that, that's why... Uh, uh, very, again, vivid memory of that conversation. Dr. Putas, you know, he was different. And back then, you could you could admit a patient for anything. So here I am, first year urology resident at Lee Memorial Hospital, and he's admitted this lady for a urethral dilation. <laughs> Honest to God, that woman stayed in the hospital three or four days after her urethral dilation, and she. He told me she was going to lose weight and she was going to die Reese after this. And I said, he's crazier than a Huda. <laughs> and John, they weigh her every day and she'd be down two pounds every day. You explain that to me, Paul. <laughs> he was slipping her some Lasix. Yeah. No. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was missing that order. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I gotta I, I, I gotta tell you a story That's about funny. Paul Shelton. <laughs> I think as I've said many times, I mean Paul is is a saint. And you know, I think but I, I finally thought of a fault. Sometimes he's too kind. And oh, I was too, to too, say that. I knew that's what too, you wanted to say. Too patient. Chief I'm chief resident. Dr. Shellhammer or somebody has asked a resident, not me, to do a procedure in x-ray. Um, this resident, and Paul, you know who it is. <laughs> this resident calls me and starts giving me a bunch of guff and saying why he doesn't want it, why it doesn't need to be done, and on and on and on. So I go down to the x-ray department and talking with him, and then we call Paul. Paul comes down. And, and, and spends 20 minutes, they're going back and forth why he should do it. He's saying why he shouldn't do it. And I'm, I'm all, everything but saying, do the goddamn x-ray, <laughs> do the procedure. You wouldn't remember that, Paul, would you? Uh, vaguely, maybe, yeah. Vaguely, I'll tell you what, no, I'll never forget it. Um, Dr. Stecker, uh, I, I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I really like to see him again at some point, you know, I, as far as my sur surgical skills, he was, he was one that, that really, you know, taught me uh, the most. I, 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 again, another vivid memory was doing a nephrectomy and without even my realizing it, you know, Jack, you'd walk in the room and, and you did, and the resident did the case, you know, and I don't know how the hell I did it, <laughs> but we just did the, you know, did the nephrectomy and like, like I was the attending. And, and I mean, he was just so confident and capable. I mean, it, it was, it was just, it was just great. Um, now in practice. Uh, couple, Sorry, couple my, my phone died. Uh, okay. Well, you're, you're not missing anything. <laughs> Come back. Actually, Come I, back. I, I love, I think I they're going to the, tr trash everything I say anyhow. Um, I love the Carl Olson story. That was great. Yeah. Well, I had no uh, idea, Joe. Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a neat story. Uh, but true. Uh, pra practice. I think, I think the best part of my practice was, uh, well, I got a couple cases in Norfolk I'm going to just kind of mention, but, you know, my, my time on the Eastern Shore, uh, that's the time when I felt the most appreciated. Uh, I think I was able to relate with the patients because I do like to fish hunt. Uh, I was interested in farming uh, uh, to, to some extent, even before I owned farm property. Um, and 
the, the neatest thing about the shore was if you did a, you did a good job, man, I'll tell you that word spread. I, I vividly remember a patient uh, who had a, a huge number of stones in his bladder. And of course, you know, to, in the more modern world, we were, had the ability to take pictures. So I gave him a copy of a picture of all the stones in his bladder. It looked like a, a nest full of, uh, of eggs. And I swear that picture went from the tip of the, the Eastern shore all the way up through Accomack County to the Maryland border. I mean, <laughs> half the patients that came in to see me after that had seen that picture. <laughs> Viral. But, uh, about, I got to talk about Ray the nudist. Uh, took care of a fella who was a uh, the only year round. He and his wife were the only year round residents at that time of the nudist colony uh, in Zunai. Okay, so back in those days, it was before PSA ball, and he was having trouble with urination. So ended up doing a, a turp on him, and of course, like ten percent of the folks came back, you know, with prostate cancer. But I said, Ray, I think, I think, you, you know, we, we do uh, surgery on you. You know, that's not a good thing. You're going to be incontinent and impotent, what have you. Oh, he said, Doc, I want you to take my prostate out. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to be the one. He said, you did a great job on my TURP. You got to take my prostate out. Well, more than reluctantly, I did a radical on him. And what do you think happened to him? I mean, he was impotent and incontinent afterwards. But he still uh, but thought he, you were great. He thought I was great, yeah. I, I made him a double pumper. <laughs> and if you need that explained, I put in a, a penile prosthesis and, and a, a, a urethral uh, device for, for his incontinence sphincter. So that, that, was, that was one. The other, the other that I, I've got to tell you is, is uh, there was a patient in Norfolk General with polyarteritis nodosa. And it was affecting both of his kidneys. Uh, and he was bleeding into both of his kidneys. And I said, my opinion was, we need to go in and take, do bilateral nephrectomies, take them both out. I mean, he's bleeding, 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 you know? And uh, Dwayne Wombo, I just say the nephrologist in, on the case turned to me one night and said, you operate on that man and I'm going to make sure he sues you. So he just kept on bleeding till we had given him about 40 units of blood. At which event, I got the blessing to go in and operate on the man. <laughs> and damn if I didn't pull him through. Uh, took out both his kidneys and that man's only thing that he wanted to do the rest of his life was make it to his daughter's wedding. And he did. So th did he have a transplant? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. I mean, yeah. you know, Paul, that's 25 years ago. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. He well, may I, have, I just knew, I, I just had learned, I, I learned at some point that he had, he had made his, his daughter's wedding. Yeah. But uh, that was, that's a memorable case. And then the last one, Lee Memorial, a uh, woman with uh, xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, bleeding, infected, hematocrits going down, down, down in the ICU. Uh, one little problem. She's a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I took her kidney out and it was like taking out cement as you, as you well know. I mean, it's, it's worse than a radical nephrectomy for cancer. And I got her hemoglobin down to three Family refused. She had refused transfusion. Uh, we didn't transfuse her. And uh, needless, needless to say, she sat in the ICU in a coma for day after day after day. And then finally, as her blood count came back, she woke up from the dead and eventually walked out of the hospital. You're, and now you're a believer for sure. Huh? Yes. <laughs> no transfusion for me. No. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last, last is the, the story. You, you want me to re take, repeat the story of the first TUR in Norfolk? Wait, wait for that one, because I want to get Mike, Mike okay. to give us a, a rundown of his 
experiences. I hope I didn't talk too long. I didn't no, talk no. Too long. <laughs> His experiences pre and during. Mike, are you still there? No. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. I'm definitely here. So, uh, well, first, uh, thanks for doing all of this. This is great. And I have enjoyed these two. I've enjoyed the stories. I mean, uh, I've heard Paul's story, uh, but I have not heard Joe's story. So I thought that was great. Um, I will give you my Carl Olson story just as an anecdote, Joe. I gave grand rounds with Lou Cavusi, and um, I forgot. I went up to LIJ, and I forgot that um, Arthur Smith and and Carl Olson were both on the faculty with Lou, and he was technically now the chairman. And okay. I had to give grand rounds, and I walk into grand rounds, and in the front row, I've got Cavusi, <laughs> Arthur Smith, Carl Olson sitting in the front row, as well as a couple uh, other folks. And I, I, I can tell you, that was only <laughs> probably about eight years ago, and I was completely panicked about the grand rounds. I, completely I panicked sure. When I saw him sitting in the front row, and he turned out to be so gracious – he was really nice. And I trained with his son-in-law. Well, his son-in-law was a resident when I was a fellow. And, uh, and that I probably helped me a little bit, but, uh, it was, uh, it was definitely intimidating. And of course, you know, the oral boards, you just, you always heard, you know, you're dead if you get them. I mean, Paul can talk about that, I'm sure, but right. uh, so interesting stories. Yeah. They don't, they don't really have things like that anymore. I don't think in urology. I mean, stories like that. Do they do it? I don't know. So, well, anyways, without further ado, uh, I guess, so you want me to talk about how I got here? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, uh, um, I'm trying not to let my phone die. Um, <laughs> so I, um, the, uh, I, uh, where do I start? Urology. Why did I go into urology? Uh, it's a, it was a, a Chinese fortune. Um, uh, I had a great time on the northern neck of uh, Virginia um, in family practice with a guy named Dr. Nichols and, uh, and another guy named Bob Newsom. And uh, these guys were great family practitioners. And they really practiced family you know, medicine like the old days delivering babies and they, they went from farm to farm and we had great, you know, uh, rapport with patients, a lot like you guys on the Eastern shore. And we would fly to Tangier Island once a week and deliver care. And, uh, we did all this great stuff. And I thought this is the greatest thing to practice medicine like this. They delivered babies and in the middle of the night, they were waking me up to go deliver babies and, uh, <clears throat> You know, I thought this is a great way to practice medicine. And then there were family docs, but I, uh, and then I did urology. Um, and I had uh, Dr. Hackler, uh, mm -hmm. honestly, was one of the more entertaining people that I've ever operated with. And uh, he uh, was just a, a constant source of uh, entertainment in the operating room. He was great. He was, uh, and, and Warren uh, Kuntz, who was a really, true gentleman, uh, uh, also uh, great. And I really had a great rotation. So I had to make a decision. Do I go into family practice or do I go into urology? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, there's a big difference there, but it wound up being a, a Chinese fortune cookie that actually sent me to urology uh, <laughs> um, uh, as we made the decision one night. And uh, uh, I remember Marlon and I went to Chinese and we kind of made this like, you know, sort of joking, let's, let's pull it out of the, uh, Let's let the fortune cookie decide. So uh, it kind of guided us into the uh, direction of urology. And, uh, uh, so actually, I, I, it was funny because I actually carried that fortune around a little bit. Uh, but uh, it, it's um, so I decided to go into urology uh, and applied um, and interviewed, uh, I think, the most programs. I think I interviewed at like 15 programs. And, and I just remember that's about as mm. much as you could travel at the time. And uh and uh, just remember uh, ranking the programs and, you know, wound up in t Philadelphia at Thomas Jefferson. And I think uh, Dr. Mulholland and I hit it off because he had trained in Virginia. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I think he was also uh, friends with, uh, uh, gosh, why am I blanking? Um, Chairman of Cornell, formerly Paul. Uh, Derek Cod Vaughn. Derek Cod Vaughn. Yeah. And anyways, uh, 
wound up matching Philadelphia. So we wound up going to Delphi and Sharp, uh, uh, historic program, but uh, um, the the Davis intubated ureterotomy, David M. Davis was the chairman before, uh, I think, Dr. Mahalan. And, uh, uh, but I wound up uh, sort of becoming uh, uh, and befriending Dr. Bagley at the time, Demetrius, I call him now, but, uh, um, and uh, he was a great influence. And Demetrius Bagley was one of the sort of early fathers of ureteroscopy, uh, along with a guy named Huffman and Lyons and Bagley and uh, uh, Joe Segura. These guys were sort of the you know, first ureteroscopist. So they were yeah. able to do ureteroscopy. They developed scopes and they were kind of very, very innovative, uh, uh, you know, a lot like Paul and his oncology. And uh, I, I just really liked the energy. So we were constantly writing papers and, you know, really enjoyed it. And, and uh, you know, he sort of suggested that I should probably do a fellowship in endourology. He thought endourology was the wave of the future. And that was in 19, the 1990s. And um, I actually wound up getting a fellowship uh, with Arthur Smith. So Arthur uh, uh, said, you know, okay, Demetrius speaks highly, we'd like you to come here. And, um, and as I went around the track, uh, I came back and I said, well, I think I'm going to do a, a, a fellowship with Dr. Smith and learn how to do percutaneous access and those type of things. And uh, Demetrius Bagley said, you know, I love Arthur but I think you should really do something in laparoscopy. That's the wave of the future. Uh, and I think that will stones already. You should go learn how to do laparoscopic surgery. And there's this guy, Lou Cavusi at Hopkins, who's sort of the up and coming guy. And you need to, you know, I think you should need to do that. And so I, I said, well, what do I do with Arthur Smith? He said, well, I'll take care of that. And that's just <laughs> kind of how it worked at that time. And yeah, I, yeah. Called, uh, I called Dr. Smith, and, you know, said that, uh, you know, I had to, I think I remember calling Dr. Smith and he's like, well, Demetrius always called me. I completely understand. Lou's a great guy and you'll have a, a good time down there. But anyways, I went down an interview with Cavusi and it was uh, the strangest interview I've ever had in my life. I walked with him all day on campus from meeting to meeting to, you know, he gave a lecture and, and we had literally a walking crazy interview, went to the robotics lab and watched a bunch of stuff there and I'm like man this guy is this guy's wild I'm not sure I understand him that much and I came back and I'm like you know are you really sure Demetrius you want me to do a fellowship with this guy and he's like look he, he's really like a foremost thought leader you need to go do, do that so I, and uh Cavusi called me the next day and in classic uh, uh Lou fashion he said uh so uh, uh do you want to do my fellowship uh, he goes yes or no <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yes. Don't waste, I'll don't do waste my time, right? Don't waste my time. Uh, and I'm like, yes, I think I do. So, uh, uh, you know, went down there, and the rest is history. Uh, you know, we uh, developed a pretty uh, significant bond, and uh, you know, worked from five thirty in the morning to eleven o'clock at night, and uh, lived the the experience of being the fellow, and uh, uh, learned a whole lot. And then, um, and then it came time to get a job. And uh, I had always wanted to come to, uh, well, one of the things I wanted to do was but I am here and uh, uh, you know, worked the deal a little bit with Dr. Showhammer when he was visiting professor at Thomas Jefferson. I think I was a fifth year resident. I went and specifically said, hey, I'll pick him up from the airport because I want to spend some time with him uh, coming from the airport. And he was the David M. Davis professor. And, and uh, you know, so this is how the uh, good old days worked. But, uh, you know, I uh, uh, was actually thinking about going with Dr. Frey Marshall to Emory or Dr. John Heaney at uh, um, Dartmouth. Um, and but I like both those jobs. And then the other option was to go to California, uh, which I really wanted to do. Actually, I wanted to go to LA or San Francisco and, and do some. And, and at the time there were a lot of endo urology jobs because very few people had fellowships in endo urology. It was only a, probably five or six years old. Uh, 
But he said, nope, that's, I've traveled the place where we're heading to Rousseau. It's a great story um, that I interviewed down here, or actually uh, I called to potentially get a job. And it turns out that they were forming Urology of Virginia. Uh, and I guess uh, Steve Schlossberg called me and said, or Dr. Schoenhammer, one of the two of you called and said, well, we really like the laparoscopy idea. We have, you know, one guy sort of doing it here, Dr. Roby, um, but we really are, <clears throat> you know, just kind of figuring out what we need. I think you guys had seven partners at the time. Kurt McCammon would have been eight. You hired him. He was a fellow. And then I would have been ninth. And um, I remember that uh, I got the phone call from you guys saying, well, there's really not a lot of, uh, available now. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see what <clears throat> happens. And I remember getting a letter uh, and um, from you guys. And the letter said, uh, I think I came down and looked at the job and we went out to dinner or whatever. And, uh, and then I think the letter came that, it was a very nicely worded letter, but it was like, well, we really don't have any positions right now. We don't think we need any urologists, which is actually a recurrent theme every year since I've been a partner. Uh, uh, most of our partners say we don't need somebody every time we try to hire somebody, although I think they're changing their attitude though. But anyways, maybe my, maybe my interview didn't go well. I don't know. but And so they, in classic Cavusi fashion, and this is great seven uh heard from he called me said, dr shellhammer did you hear dr shellhammer at evms i said well i haven't heard anything and he's uh and he and he literally looked at my mailbox because my mailbox was next to his in the office and he goes there's a letter here and the letter was the letter saying hey we enjoyed it, but we don't really need anybody now. We're not hiring any urologist. Pretty much have a good day. And I was totally, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'll move on to the next job. Well, Lou read the letter, but in classic Lou fashion, he goes, there's a letter here. And, and, he, and, he, and he opens the letter and he reads the letter. And then I said, well, Lou, what's it say? And I'm on the speakerphone in the operating room. And he goes, it says everything's going to be fine. No problems. And, you know, very funny story. And I'm like, what does it say? He goes, he goes, finish the case. We'll talk about it afterwards. And, and uh, you know, so uh, he knew, I think, that Marlon really wanted to go there. And I guess Lou, unbeknownst to me, wrote a nice letter to Dr. Schohammer and, uh, and the rest is history. Um, he, he basically said in no uncertain terms, if you guys don't take this guy, you will regret it for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> so Schlossberg, those of you who knew Schlossberg, who was very uh, orientated to the bottom line, you know, shook his head a little bit. And I said, Steve, you don't get these kind of proclamations just and ignore them. This, we, this is a, a future investment. And so we made the investment. Yes. Well, you, and, I, you, Kabusi, and I have... He spared no words of, of uh, certainty. Well, too kind, but I, I will just tell you that I'm in deep gratitude to you for the rest of my life for that. And, uh, you know, so uh, the next thing I know, a couple nights later, I get a phone call from Steve Schlossberg and Paul Schoenhammer offering me a job. And uh, uh, so that was the, uh, the and, and of course, I, I owe a lot to Lou for, for going out on a limb like that. And, uh, um, and, and I think uh, that was a, uh, that was a great thing. And, 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 and I've always said, and this is a true story, I've had three mentors in my life, uh, really professionally, and, 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 and Demetrius Bagley, Luke Cavusi, and Paul Schoenhammer. So, uh, you know, pretty unbelievable uh, uh, mentors to have. But the, uh, you know, so it was, a, it was a great ride. And then, uh, you know, got to uh, merge the groups and we got to practice with Joe, whom I, I love and adore. And, uh, you know, had many a good times with, and, and this practice is great. I, I will tell you, and Paul probably doesn't remember this, but my first couple cases when I get here, usually when you start off, you start off with a couple slow cases. Um, but my first couple cases here, I did a couple ureteroscopies. Uh, I think day two of cases was a laparoscopic nephroureterectomy from Dr. Schauhammer for an upper tract tumor. And, uh, that was probably case number four or five here. And I thought, well, this is an ultimate test. They're basically testing 
to me here. They want to see if I can do this services a share cat but a couple weeks after I was credentialed at Norfolk General but then I uh, and then what happened is that uh, Paul took me under his wing and uh, as Paul does so many times just got me involved in a thousand different academic uh, things and you know publishing and great ideas after one idea after another and put me on panels and getting me you know talking at the SUO and and uh in talking about laparoscopic surgery and these type of things. And then he came to me one day and said, you know, I, I, I saw a laparoscopic radical prostatectomy and I think that's the wave of the future. And I, I love to tell the story. That's a terrible did lap prostates and, and uh, he thought it was a terrible operation. And, and, uh, but Paul had sort of said, I think this is the wave of the future. And he and Jerry Jordan uh, also, an, uh, you know, great mentor did uh, uh, you know, uh, knew had a lot of connections and brought uh, uh, this. Uh, well, we actually, they sent me, I sent, I went to France for like a week and spent some time with Valencian and Gillino. Uh, Dr. Valencian and Dr. Gillino, who were the sort of the world's experts who developed the operation in earnest. And they had done about 160 at the time. And I went there and literally watched them do lap prostates for about nine days. Actually, uh, I remember Marlon went on that trip and she wanted to go to Paris, went the, uh, you know, I, I basically was there all day, every day watching them do lap prostates. And I came back and thought I could do that operation by myself. And I remember doing the first case or two with Paul. And it was the most humbling operation I've ever done, trying to learn a lap prostate without having one of these guys who's done this and kind of, you know, had all the trials and tribulations. And uh, Jerry Jordan, I think, knew stuff on learning in Germany and said, well, let's bring this guy, Harry Turk, over. And uh, we brought Harry over and uh, Harry... Uh, was this big outgoing gregarious guy and uh, looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger and helped mentor me through uh, 160 lap prostates or so. And, uh, and so we had, I think one of the largest experiences in the country, Paul, didn't we at the time? Yeah, the think, lap yeah. prostates. And, 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 uh, right, as you guys talk, it, it, it reminds me of the statement that life happens while you're making plans. Your know, life kind of uh, takes its, uh, turns for the right and the left. So uh, great stories. I want to get to to Lynn Vass and to Kim because, gosh, they've been in the background pushing the foreground. So Lynn, how about your story here? I remember when you were a teenager, basically, yeah. and uh, now you're, you're the, the girl. So let us know how it happened. I'm the man. I'm the man. Oh, the man. Okay. I didn't want to get accused of any kind of impropriety, you know. <laughs> trans this, trans that. I mean, the only take I can I I would like to share is about the residency and the fellowship, because that's what I'm been doing for yes. a long time. And basically, I can say that I feel the divines, both Pat and Charles, would be very proud to see where we are with our training programs, that we did not let it fold, we're thriving, we're doing extremely well. Um, <clears throat> their reach for international continues on today. Um, and we have a big robust group too. So, I mean, like we've, we've got a large residency, residents, fellows, um, and they're diverse too. So that's actually taken us to a whole nother level. There's every, Every culture you can think of, we've got females, which for years we didn't, um, you know, and so with that, I think they're very proud. They would be proud. Um, and my, my story about Dr. Charles um, would be, I remember he retired and he came in every single week to gather his mail. He could not get, he could not retire. He ate and slept urology. And I love that about him. 
Yes, and I and I forgot he had a hobby. He had photography, Dr. Conneval. So thank you for reminding me of that. Because I kept thinking mm -hmm. he didn't have a hobby. He loved mm -hmm. his family and he loved neurology. So um, yeah, those are my um, stories. And I think that he'd be proud too of our faculty. I think that um, we have a great group of physicians that love to teach and that's kept our program going. And our leaders beyond them, Dr. Shellhammer, of course you, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Lynch and Dr. McCammon, we, we couldn't have done it without, with it all. So anyways, I've learned a lot. Yeah. I, learned, I learned the most from you, Dr. Shellhammer. No, but Linda, I mean, you got to say, really have. When, you, when you first came here, you were how old and what were you doing? And then Judy Zirkel kind of mentioned. Oh, you want to hear that? Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, okay, no. So yeah, I, yes. Yeah, I'd like okay. to hear that. So I did two years of college. I have an associate's degree and I, I don't know, it's my first interview. I can remember the dress. I was, I was wearing a purple dress and Judy interviewed me and it was like a love story. Judy and I like were like tit for tat. We were like a good team. And of course they hired me. Oh, well, we'll have you come for a week and see if you like it. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, what else was I going to do? So I did it. Didn't know what I was getting into. Um, never learned a lot. That's for sure. Judy was a great mentor. And by all means, I learned everything I could from her and you, Dr. Shellhammer too, of course. Um, and I don't know, I, I wasn't like the residency coordinator at the beginning. I was just, I was hired to be a secretary. I was with Dr. Tynes for eight years. I learned a lot from him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was like his right, right hand and left hand. Um, and then I went from there, the position opened to be the coordinator. So I said, okay, I'm up for the challenge. Did not know what I was getting into. I got into the frying pan that year that, um, that was right after there was a graduation and we had a site visit that year. And I picked up my purse on several occasions and said, I, I'm out of here, I'm out of here. It was that stressful. And site visits, if anybody knows anything about it, they're very stressful and they still are to this day. How many other years I've been in my position? It just, it, very stressful. But anyways, I stuck at Judy, calmed me down, told me, come on, come on. And, and if it weren't for her, I probably wouldn't even be here today talking to you. So how many years now are you marking with, with the group? How All right, now you're gonna know how old I am because you got to get the calculator out. I came here when I was 19. Um, I've been here 41 years. Yes, I turned 60 this year. Well, you don't look a day over 30. No doubt. Well, thank you. That's anyway, a great story, so, Lynn. No, Thanks. and I talk, the thing is that time, it just seems like time is speeding up. Like it is nothing to a day now. And I, I mean, you know, I can't imagine. So one day I'm going to get where you are, Dr. Conifal, and I'm going to enjoy telling all those fun stories and being retired. I'm looking yes. forward to that. <laughs> but not for a while, not for a while. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying, I'm looking forward to it. Just like Dr. Charles, I'll tell you one other story about Dr. Charles. I remember him calling us on the phone and this is when he was retired and he would be like talking about the birds in the yard. I'm like, oh my God, really? Like if you knew him, you, that wasn't him but he enjoyed retirement and he was enjoying nature outside and the birds in his backyard and telling us about it. Good. Uh, yes. Yeah, hopefully we can get there one day. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Well, Kim, Kim, the, the, the uh, microphone turns to you for your impressions and how you arrived and how you've, gosh, grown to the position you now have. Yeah. Um, Lynn, didn't, weren't you secretary for Dr. Lynch at one point too? Or well, yeah. yeah. I mean, like after, but I was the residency coordinator. Okay. And I was, do and Dr. Lynch too. So yeah, I had lots of other jobs. Okay. Yeah. But I, I remember you at SCI whenever yes. with Dr. Lynch. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So okay. I had friends that actually lived down here from Ohio. And so they were like, you need to move down here. So I happened to be down here visiting and that's when you looked in the newspaper for ads and there was an ad and you would actually put the address of the place that you were applying to would be there. So I said, oh my goodness, this is for me. It was a advertising for an x-ray tech and a medical assistant because this was in 94. 
that they hired somebody who could do both so they could utilize them in x-ray. So I um, went, I was going around, I went to CHKD and put my application in and I saw the first child in the wagon being pulled and I'm like, there's no way I can do that. So I told my girlfriend, I said, I really want to find this place. And of course, then there was no cell phone with GPS or anything like that. So she said, well, do you just want to fax it? I'm like, no, I don't want to fax it. I want to, um, sorry about that. I want to um, stop there. So we found the Hague office and I walked in and um, I think her name was Christy that used to work in the, um, with, I can't remember the one lady's name that was like with in the pay area. And they said, well, you need to talk to Sherry and she's at our first Colonial Road office. So I got the address, we drove out there, they were in the little Pizza Hut buildings on yeah. First Colonial. So I walked in and I'm like, hi, Kathy Vaughn was there and um, Carol Parker, Jean's daughter was there. And Kathy was leaving to go to the Eastern Shore to work at that office. So I said, I'm really trying to get a hold of um, Sherry. I wanted to know if I could set up an interview, yada, yada, yada. And so I basically stalked her until Sherry called me. Um, they, they, she called back to the office and I was leaving like the day after net, the, like two days later. So Sherry said, okay. So she set me up with an interview with Dr. Five Ash, um, which was, you know, and I'll be honest, I didn't know anything about urology except for the retrogrades and things I had done in the OR and the hypertensive IBPs and all of that in the <laughs> hospital and whatnot. So I was like, great, no problem. So um, I went back the next day, I met with Dr. Five Ash and, um, you know, he asked me all kinds of questions, told me sometimes you might have to get my lunch. I'm like, no problem. I don't mind doing that at all. <laughs> and so um, I left then and then Sherry called me. It was at the end of January, I think in 94, he said, okay, if you want the job, it's yours. I said, great. So I came down, Kathy Vaughn trained me um, and she went to the Eastern shore. So, you know, back then you had charts you were going to prep and thank heavens, Dr. Five Ash, like literally I could, I knew what he was going to do on everybody. He was so like mm -hmm. the same yeah. way for every single thing he did. So Kathy left after a couple of weeks, went to the shore and I, you know, carried on. And so I quickly came to realize that sometimes you might get my lunch was every single day you were going to get my lunch. <laughs> and so I, every single day I had to go to Virginia beach general hospital and get a salad from the salad bar with beets, tomatoes, <laughs> and, um, it was carrot. This is above and beyond. Yeah. And then, it was, and then we would play a game every day of how much did the salad weigh and how much did it cost? <laughs> So sometimes I would just let him win, like, oh my gosh, it's exactly right. But <laughs> I didn't have the salad bar open for some reason. I, at the this hospital. is hilarious. I had to go to Wendy's up the street and okay. get the salad that was pre-made and then pick all the stuff out that he didn't want. <laughs> so then I would put it on his desk and I would put his cholesterol medicine out, his cup, his silverware, and his... Uh, no pulp orange juice so he could mix his cholesterol medicine. Then I had to do the dishes. And if the, if the uh, blue cheese dressing ran out or the orange juice, I had to pick it up and then he would pay me back. So, um, and everybody was afraid of him. Everybody was afraid of him. Like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole time I worked with him, and I can remember like when I first started, I was doing a cysto and Kathy says, we're going to numb them up. I'm like, we're going to do what? Like, <laughs> you need to do what? Because the only sisters I had ever seen were under general anesthesia in the OR. And I'm like, okay. 
And so it was definitely an eye-opening experience. I do thank heavens that I started back then because I don't know if my brain could handle all the things these days that all these people have to learn. And so, um, you know, I called out one time with Dr. Five Ash. The whole time I was there, my grandmother fell and broke her hip. And I went back to Ohio while she was getting surgery. And somebody came and worked with him and they cried. I'm like, what are you talking about? So he made them cry. And he only yelled at me one time about a patient. This man called in and I can still remember his name. I've, I've been pretty, I've held on to this for a very long time, <laughs> clearly. Let and, it out, let it out. <laughs> and um, the man called in and complained of gross hematuria. Dr. Five Ash was on his yearly vacation to, I think he went to the Bahamas or something every like end of February or March. So it was right when I was on my own. So I called Dr. Roby and I'm like, here's what's going on. I didn't even know enough to look back in the chart at the man's history. So Dr. Roby tells me to get an IVP and I don't remember what else. So Dr. Five Ash comes back in and I had all his charts stacked up on his desk with all the results from while he was gone. And he says, Kimberly. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, why would you order an IVP on this man? I said, well, I didn't order it. I spoke to Dr. Roby and he told me to do it. He has a history of this. He didn't need this IVP. And all I said was, I'm sorry, sir. I thought I was doing the right thing. And that was the end of it. And he never yelled at, he never raised his voice ever at me, but I heard he'd made plenty of people cry before that. And so then, I left right after that. Dr. Five Ashes, this is a, a good memory of him, was that I was pregnant with my son. I went into labor and went into the hospital at the same time he was retiring and having his back surgery. So the next day, they're wheeling him upstairs to my room, and um, he's in there for his back, and I'm there having the baby. I had the baby. And so to this day, he still calls me is this Dr. Ramsey? He'll call and ask, you know, and he's like, such and such called me, you know? So, um, but I enjoyed my time there. Then I left for a couple years. Dr. Yor drugged me back in. I was doing some like retrospective chart reviews. And then he's like, well, just come back. You, you can work whatever you want. And that lasted about, I don't know, three months, I think. And then I was back. And so I moved through a lot of different jobs. Diane Rowe retired and I took her job as a research coordinator. So that was nice. And, um, you know, I've just been blessed. The, the practice has been extremely good to me. Um, you know, as far as the three that are on the phone, Dr. Conifal, my funniest memory of you, and I just talked about this the other day with someone is about your your need to beat your own time at a vasectomy. Yeah. <laughs> you like set my set the timer, and then it, when you went in the room, set the timer, and then as soon as you come out, what time was it? You would constantly want to beat your uh, vasectomy uh, time for that, and um, and then I also remember when we went to Bayside and had the office there, and we got the <laughs> EMR, and you were like. I am not a secretary. You would scream it every day to anyone that would listen. Um, <laughs> and Dr. Shellhammer, I have told this story of numerous times about you. So you were at SCI and Paul had his heart attack. So we were all coming down there to fill in for you, you know, to help with Paul. Sure. And we would put all of the results in a, um, in a folder and give to you. Well, you know, and it was a lot of stuff that I had never seen working with Dr. Five Ash. So there was one on there that you wrote something about his PSA, et cetera. And I didn't quite know what I was supposed to do about it. So I called him and I'm like, are you sure that this is okay? And you're like, well, his last PSA was 2.9 and it was nowhere on the there was nowhere on that piece of paper. You didn't have the chart. And I'm like, yeah. in my head, I didn't really know you. And I'm like, there is no way he is remembering this at all. And I looked it up and I was like, oh my God, his PSA was 2.9. How could you remember this? 
And then I filled, my, I filled my mind with a lot of facts. Yeah. Yeah. Some of which were not. It was for. very impressive. And then I think for me, one of the hardest things I've ever done is having to close. And it makes me emotional because you guys were so sad to close the Eastern Shore office. Yeah. Yeah, that was tough. Yeah. Like, I, Joe, like Joe said, that that was that was a privilege for me to be able to fade out there. That was, yeah, uh, was and, and you know what really gets you is when you drive through the toll booth, which they used to have then because right there was no uh, easy pass. Yeah, right, Gosh, the toll collector would would know you because, as Joe yep. said. The, the word that they say, oh, have a nice trip, come back next week. So it was right, a unique, right. unique experience. Yeah, I've never right. seen Dr. You're Shellhammer right. angry, but he did fuss at me a bit about that. Like, you all need to think about what you're doing. And then Dr. Conifal was, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with all my time. And then literally he does, doesn't have any time. And for Dr. Fabrizio is just his ability to like, forecast and see the future and take risks that I think nobody else would probably take at certain times has has been you know obviously very lucrative and productive and beneficial to our patients so but yeah that's and it's amazing to see the things that we do now I mean when I worked with Dr. Five she did a perineal prostate biopsy yeah you know? Yeah, it was and we're like, gonna go back to that. We'll right, go back to that I know. I was like, I said, do we need to bring him in to teach everyone? Although well, yeah, I'll say, I'll say about Kim. I speak with Joe Fivesh maybe every three to four weeks, and like every aging person, he has his aches and pains, and he often says, "Well, I'm gonna get in touch with Kim because she'll know what to do." So obviously, <laughs> your your salad bar has transferred to your medical direction. Yeah. So how did you get where you are? I served a salad faithfully for two years. Yeah. That's well, such it, a great story. It, it, and Joe, Joe is interesting because when I first came here, I mean, I think it's his Virginia uh, conservatism and properness and uh, you know, someone from New York, gosh, I had these funny accent. And it just didn't kind of didn't kind of jive with him. So he was somewhat, uh, I'll say, aloof, not not hostile in any way, but just aloof. So I felt a little uh, intimidated. But obviously, once you get to know him, he's just as uh, sweet he as is. can be. Yeah. yeah. It, he yeah. called my husband's truck one time to go to Norfolk Feed and Seed. And at that time, my husband had like an 89 Toyota that was all up on big tires. And it was a manual transmission. Yes. <laughs> <It was not laughs> a I was like, can I borrow Tyler's truck? I'm like, uh, sure. What? Sure. No problem. I would have paid money to see him get in it and and, and go right. around it, that would have been a picture worth having, but I never got that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, what has happened <sighs> since I've been here and, you know, and hope for the same things for people that work for us now that in another, you know, so many years, they're having the 125th anniversary and that they can, you know, and I do think when we were a little smaller, it was a little bit closer. We knew each other. We knew everybody. And, you know, it's a little hard when you get as large as we are now, but I still think that having, you know, your pockets of people is, is good, but yeah. So. Well, yeah. gosh, thanks everyone for joining in together and, and spending a, a very enjoyable hour of reflection. You I, I have one thing to say. Yes. One, one thing, because y'all are talking about the Eastern Shore. Just one, this is a funny story. So I don't know if you remember this, Dr. Shellhammer, but you used to have to, you would leave the office at the hospital and go to the Eastern Shore for the, you know, and they would give you this case that had the Cisto stuff in it, I guess, Cisto kit, whatever it was, for you to take over there. And one time you had it and you left it like in the parking lot, like yeah. you didn't get it in your car yeah. and the hospital called and they thought it was wrong. <laughs> so they roped it all off and did that. We yeah. thought that was. 
I was thinking about the PSA instead of my instead of what I was supposed to be carrying. I remember that. Yes. Thank, <laughs> thankfully, great. I was not. Thankfully, I wasn't apprehended by the local sheriff. Yeah. Uh, well, if we're going to talk about Paul, I I I have a vivid memory of pulling on to um, 264, leaving Norfolk. And Paul's passing me in one of his old junkers that he that he was driving back then. What? And, and he's Keeper, the they phone. call it the bread. He's, on, he's um, on the phone talking, and eating a sandwich at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that was dangerous. No, no moment. <laughs> that was uh, unwise multitasking. I recognize yeah. that now. <laughs> and the phone didn't we, even have speaker. <laughs> Do, do, do I we think we better time? close. Uh, I Are you say, sure you have, you have it right? He was recording. You, you have he was recording. He didn't want on the phone. Yeah, yeah I was using the dictaphone. Yeah. Yeah, it was the dictaphone. He wasn't on the telephone. Yeah, dictaphone. I mean, on the dictaphone. Right. It wasn't the telephone. Yeah. It was before the days of cell. Oh, come on. <laughs> All I know, he was he was going like that and eating like that. I don't know how. The I wonder if you'd get in trouble if you got a dictaphone holding up driving now. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thank against you for the law. Oh. Oh, uh, those were some good. There were some good times, and right. I've certainly been honored to practice with you guys and and all the staff. Uh, you know, I mean, Lindy, Kim, Lynn. I mean, just really great, great stuff. And I can remember the small days at the Hague when there was just nine of us. That was really nice, yes. and uh, we got to see each other quite a bit. And and then. Uh, and then even with Joe and Gil, when we merged the groups and, and Robert, I think, came over, it was, it was just nice yep. having all of us seeing each other all the time. And we don't do that now. And, and we also had a group of really collegiality. I mean, you know, who would tolerate now in our practice doing eight-hour robotic prostatectomies with the Zeus system or pure lap prostates? You can't even imagine yeah. a group allowing that to happen, which they allowed to happen when, uh, you know, letting us do those crazy things. Yeah. The group has been a merger of multiple cultures, groups, it's, and we finally, when we finally merged, we found out that we were very compatible. It was a, it was a, and sometimes it takes a forced issue, like uh, the hospitals trying to take over a lot of medicine, but we were very fortunate years and years ago to uh, get together and realize that we, we were closer and we were more comrades together than we were apart. And so that, but it was, it was a very satisfying experience that we didn't, we really realized that it was important for us to make decisions together as urologists. And we found out that we were all very similar and very, in, in a lot of respects. So we, it, it was a very good thing to do. And it was very unusual for as many urologists, as many guys to get together guys and girls to get together uh, and enjoy the relationship and, and, and make it worthwhile. Yeah, that's a good point, Jack. You know, we're on the panel tonight with actually three representatives from the three groups that came together. So, and Steve Schlossberg, to his credit, really had the vision before others were doing it to put groups together that, that you know, we weren't the enemy. We were competing and passed each other in the in the halls of the hospital, but really not as efficient as banding together and then having one voice to deal with the hospitals, the insurance companies, and that really made a difference. But again, we were very much on the forefront of that. And, and I, you know, I'll credit Steve for having that vision and, and you know, slugging through to make that happen. But again, with, with you, Jack, and, and Dr. Given, Robert, you know, it, it brought three different cultures together, they were really, like you said, more similar than, than what we thought. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm the, the last one that came in of this group. And uh, so it wasn't very long after I got here that the merger talks were taking place. And, you know, what they thought were differences actually weren't really significant. Um, and they realized that actually as a group, the whole was much better than the individual entities. Yes. Yeah, and we had a common goal, you know, common, uh, you know, um, common thing driving us, which was uh, which was good.
And we did it in a very timely fashion because at the time we did it, we didn't realize all the, 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 the mechanics of what was happening to the hospitals and they were all getting together and the hospitals were being bought. Doctors were grouping, doctors groups were being bought. And um, I think we were very fortunate that we did it at that time. Because it, what year was it, you think? 97, you think? I think so. I think it was about the around then. Yeah. Mm. And, and, it, and, it, and it wasn't, I don't know, I, it's, it's hard to say, like you said, uh, Greg, that it was, maybe Steve had a, had a, had a very influential view of what ne needed to be done, but we were very lucky, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, also, urologists have a very, have a different attitude towards medicine than a lot of other practices do. And uh, we're very much there to help each other. We were very much there to help each other. And it was more about helping the group make it than an individual, because if the group didn't make it, the individuals wouldn't make it. Yeah. No, it's neat. Well, um, I mean, it is pretty exciting that the group has been um, really the, the divines and the in early inspiration was now, you know, reaching a hundred years. And I'm not sure how I got invited to be part of this because I've only been part of the group for a third of that time, but um, I haven't been there all hundred years like some of you guys, but um, <laughs> no, it, it is amazing that, um, you know, it has transcended all of that time and all of the changes in healthcare and, you know, where, where we are now. Um, I mean, just me personally, I will say that, uh, you know, I stumbled into urology. I knew I wanted to do something surgical. The more general surgery I did, the less I liked that. I almost went into cardiac surgery, but at the time I didn't want to get divorced and wanted to at least have some sort of life and uh, rotated with the urologist at MCV that both of you guys were familiar with. And they just seemed like fun, normal guys. And um, I said, wow, this is, I'd love to be able to do this and shifted gears. And it was really Paul Schallheimer that gave me the chance. And, uh, you know, no greater mentor than, uh, than Paul. I mean, uh, national and international reputation and just was, uh, um, really took me under his wing and, and, uh, you know, made, made my career and my, uh, my success possible. That's wonderful. I want him to I think all this. three of us had, all three of us had an MCV connection. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's interesting. And we all did part of our residency there. Yeah, you Paul did the was, first two years at MCV, Greg, and then you came to EVMS or? Yeah, I was general surgery okay. at MCV. And at the time it was two years to get into urology. And yeah. um, my um, second year, I really kind of um, said, this is really what I want to do. But as you probably know, when you were there, if you declared you were anything but general surgery loyal, you were a, a stepchild and maybe I should put all this out there, but um, so I had to really interview and, and look for a job I in secret. And uh, it was quite the challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was right at the time and really before the match kind of came and, and, uh, and Paul, you know, gave me the shot and, uh, um, you know, I only inter got to talk to a few places, but um, yeah, I was lucky I had the opportunity. And, you know, I knew I wanted to be somewhere in the Southeast, but uh, uh, yeah, it just worked out, worked out great. Paul was very instrumental in my going into urology. The first, you know, my two first two years of general surgery was um, it was very interesting. You know, the, the pressures were there, and, and uh, but I think Paul and the rest of the guys that were there in urology were they set an ex a wonderful example of what it was like to be a physician with a family and work hard and treat your fellow physicians and patients properly. And um, I think it had a lot of influence on what I wanted to do. No question. Yeah. yeah, I think it is a sleeper specialty. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I had a one hour lecture that was, that was nothing enlightening in medical school. So I had no idea what urology was. And, but seeing it as a, um, as an intern, my second month, I rotated with those guys. And just like you said, Jack, they were normal. They, they got to, diagnose, um, think, work up a problem, 
then fix it and then have a happy patient and, and move to the next one. Or, you know, and it was such a variety of things, you know, whether it was the general urology, the oncology, the pediatrics, and, you yeah. know, just getting all that exposure. And, and you think it's a, really a pigeonhole specialty where it's really a, a very broad, uh, um, a broad, you know, opportunity. Yeah, Lindy, I, I think for you, I don't know, I don't know what your background was as far as being exposed. I think uh, Greg and I were both from. Go ahead, Robert. Go ahead. I think uh, Greg and I are both from the area, and that's part of what probably brought us back here. And Greg trained here. I trained in Richmond. Jack, were you? Where were you? What brought you here? Um, I love the area. I grew up here, so so. so oh, yeah, you good. grew up here too. Okay. Yeah, so we're. <clears throat> Very similar in that respect, but, 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 but it was a great area and uh, I knew I wanted to come back to this area to practice because of family ties. Yeah, I just- All three of us had came, family ties. Yeah, um, before you came on, Robert, yeah, I was just telling Jack that, you know, thank goodness I got to see him and I can update all these patients that I see who are always asking about Jackie. How's Jackie? You know, what, what's Jackie doing? What, you know, have you seen Jackie recently? So I can, uh, I can uh, update my spiel there. So that's good. Well, you had a special bond, Jack. I know. And they would all call my friend. I'm Dr. Drucker's friend, my friend. I know. It was, it, and it worked. I mean, you, you were, you were uh, the ultimate, uh, um, you know, uh, patient experience, uh, a doctor. Well, I was, I was very fortunate. I had wonderful patients and, you know, and I, I, I felt very comfortable, um, not leaving because I was leaving, but because I knew I had wonderful partners to take care of patients. That was, that was incredible. So I was very, very fortunate. But Lindy, one thing about urology, and I don't know what your experience was with other specialties. Urology is very unique because we, we, don't, we, don't, we rarely send the patient off to someone else to take care of an issue. We make the diagnosis, we do the workup, we encounter with the patient as far as uh, informing them and their family as to what's expected, and we take care of the problem. As surgeons, we are multifaceted and we can, we can do that. So we rarely send the patient off to someone else to, to be taken care of after we make the diagnosis, unlike a lot of specialties. I, I, think that, I think that the times have made it so that we almost have to adjust to what's going on right now. Of course, we miss the old times because it was uh, much less pressure, much less, much less time consuming on a lot of documentation. There was a lot of things that we had to do before, right. do now that we didn't have to do before. Exactly. The, 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 the patients remain the same. They're wonderful people and they trust you and they, that commonality of, of, of from before and now, is, it doesn't change how you interact with your patients. Those are things that we, that we have built in into each one of us. But the times yeah. have changed. Pressures in medicine have changed yeah. in every other industry. Yeah, and yeah that's a yeah. Great, great point. Great yeah. point, Jack. Um, you know, I think the, uh, we would all love to just take our computers and just smash them on the street, but uh, unfortunately, times have changed. But you're you're right; the interaction with the patients hasn't changed. The basic practice of urology hasn't changed. Some of the advances that we've had have been wonderful, so that that's great. In that respect, we're much more mentally invasive in our surgery. Patient recovery is better. I do think we all miss the the time, you know, having more time with the patients. You know, we're under more time pressure because there's sh such a shortage of urologists, both locally and nationally. That we're there, we just there are more patients than there are, you know, urologists take care of them right now. We're doing our best, but yeah, no, I think that both you guys' points are great, and I mean, I think the, you know, what I think patients don't understand. I mean, we're we're still a business. We have to survive. We have to support ourselves. We have no really outside help for that. And really the, what we are paid for what we do hasn't changed in the 30 years I've been around. So the only way to survive that business and to continue to thrive or try to thrive is just with efficiencies, with um, standardization, with really streamlining what we do. And that's definitely been a challenge. And, and like you guys both have said, what really 
makes us happy is having that interaction with the patient and having that um, opportunity to to bond with them and then to to help them through a, a process and sometimes you know a, a life threatening process and yeah. so I think it you know we've been great in this group continuing to focus on that and really trying to do that but there I can tell you I mean Lindy to answer your question what's changed I think that's the biggest thing really keeping your eye on the prize the the, the patient and that patient experience with it to work through all the other um, obstacles we have now. It's, um, it's tough. Yeah, and it's and we are, of- like you said, Robert, it's a shortage. Yeah. It is key being, our, you know, our, in control of our own destiny. And again, we've been very lucky with the, the, the leaders and the people we've had that, that have made that happen, you know, starting with, with, for me, Paul, I mean, the divines laid the groundwork and yes. when um, Charlie, retired is when I came on. So I really didn't get to interact with those guys much. But uh, again, they set the standard for, you know, worldwide, repu- you know, reputation. And then Paul was amazing. He really brought the, um, the academic side, the, um, the political clout, the, the um, you know, the, the reputation to us and, right. and really the, the academic part and the, the training part. So you know, again, greatest mentor of all time. I um, mean, then the other personalities early on, I mean, Jerry Jordan was great as far as, you know, I didn't get to work with him a lot. Personally, recon wasn't my, um, my favorite, you know, button, but I, just seeing how he interacted with other docs, how he built an international reputation and, and opened doors and that that could be done, you know, was really um, intriguing for me. And, um, you know, Schlossberg, we talked about Steve was, was great from the, he saw the business side of things. Um, and, and often to us fighting, you know, really is um, with him with that, but he had that vision to kind of lead us through. He was technically a, a meticulous surgeon that I learned from. I know Boyd Winslow has been in the loop with this. He was an amazing um, teacher, mentor. He was great in the OR. He truly, um, amazing ambidextrous surgeon um he but really stressed the fundamentals to to do a tough operation and and he was so good at as you were coming up that he would let you do what you could to the top of your ability and um you know i think maybe having 27 kids had something to do with that for him but he knew how to to teach and to to mentor which uh which was awesome um and there are plenty of others too. You know, we were lucky, you know, Kurt McCammon joined us. He really continued the academic mission and has done great with that and with our residency program that, you know, we're very unique around the country that we have a very good business practice, but a very good academic uh, practice too. And, and we get to really do what we like to do. And then, you know, Mike Fabrizio, the business side really has continued that and taken that up a level with um, the innovation and the um, keeping us on the forefront of all that. And, and that's, again, very, very fortunate that we, we have all that. Dr. Yur, does Dr. Drucker know about the surgery that you performed last year that was shown around the world online? I'm sure he's watched it multiple times, but um, if not, I'll send him. But, you know, no, I, I mean, I've been very lucky that to have the opportunities that I've had. And that, again, that's all due to Paul Shellhammer and Jerry Jordan and really opening that. So really a pay it forward kind of attitude. You know, Paul early on, he had was overwhelmed with things and he said, here, I, I really don't like BPH. Why don't you go to this meeting, go do this. And Run with it. you know, it just right. gave me, I mean, he blazed the trail for me. And so I try to pay it forward with our younger ones now. But I mean, I've I've gotten to operate in 14 different countries around the world and I've, I've visited many, many more than that, more than 30 states. And, yeah. you know, I couldn't have done that. I can't imagine in any other group and without, you know, these guys kind of um, blazing that trail. So, and again, that's, you know, I was very fortunate early on to when I was trying to decide where to go once I finished residency. And, you know, I looked ahead and said, you know, five years, 10 years, what do I see myself doing? And, and I think I would have been bored with just regular general country urology. And um, right. with this group, it really gave you the opportunity. Well, hey, if I like research more, 
um, or if I you know, like teaching the residents mm -hmm. or want to do this or that. And, and there were even opportunities I didn't even know existed at that time. But again, I, I don't, I, I never second guess that, uh, that decision. You know, I think that, you know, our practice is very unique in the, uh, we really, all the different aspects that we cover. We're a community group. So we're taking care of the local community. We're an academic group. So we're often on the forefront of many things going on nationally and internationally. We have a residency program and a fellowship program. So we're training the next generation of urologists. Um, it's just, a, it's a really unique practice that you don't see many places in the country. Not at all. And we're still yeah. independently owned and operated. We're not, you know, we're, we um, run our own ship here. And it's, it's a really unique opportunity and, you know, I'm honored to have been part of it. And as you're going through the residency, you, you're, you're kind of looking at the different aspects of urology. Yeah. And I always found the cancer aspect of urology the most interesting part in my mind. Uh, the unique, uh, you know, each cancer is unique, each individual patient. Um, I, I enjoy the complexity of it, the surgery. I enjoy that. Um, you know, when you have a success, it's very rewarding. Unfortunately, we're not 100% successful, but we do the best we can. You know, the other areas of urology that, that you know, I enjoyed too, but that was what really kind of yeah. you know, drew my interest. Right. And when I came here, you know, I, as uh, we mentioned earlier, there were there were three different groups that merged a couple of years after I was here. Right. And um, I got to give uh, Paul Shelmer was very good at pulling me under his wing, mm -hmm. you know, got me involved in some studies. Uh, so it was very helpful to get me involved academically. Here we are. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pile on that. You know, Robert has been amazing with the clinical trial aspect of things. Again, that's something so unique with our group. We typically have, on average, 40 clinical trials going at a time. And that's, you know, private practice groups don't have that. And many academic groups would be jealous of that. And you know, we probably say no more to yes than clinical trial opportunities. Um, I just had that discussion today, as a matter of fact, offered a trial and do we really want to do it? Is there a better one, you know, in using our resources? But, but you know, Robert has been great with that. The oncology has been definitely the flagship as far as trials over the last, you know, handful of years. And, and he's really been the, the leader with those and, and getting us um, opportunities. And I think, you know, it's, it's an extra challenge for us as urologists, but mm -hmm. I love the fact that it gives us an opportunity to offer our patients something that other groups and can't. So I just had this discussion with a patient who recently diagnosed with prostate cancer and send them to, to Robert and his team to say, you know, hey, you, you may be a good candidate for some of the trials we have. And don't think of it as experimental, but it really gives you an opportunity to have access to a drug, a medication, a therapy that you couldn't get otherwise, or your insurance wouldn't pay for, but you're in on the early bandwagon with, with this, you know, groundbreaking stuff. You know, uh, it, it's very unique that we have a group like this. Um, yeah, it is. And, 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 and insofar as we have many people who specialize in certain areas, so the rest, I was, a, I was always trained as a general urologist. We all started off in cancer, female urology, and multiple other things. But as time went on, it was, it, we found that it was important to become more specialized. And Greg, you've taken up a, 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 a great, great efforts in, in, in making, you know, your, your, the field of BPH and all the nuances and all the new procedures. <laughs> You know, you've, ex you've been exemplary as far as being someone who is knowledgeable in all the aspects of it. And Robert, you as well with cancer. I mean, I don't know of anyone, anyone that has more respect as far as their cancer work than you. And, but I, I can say that about many aspects of our field. We, we have um, the reconstructive aspects. The, uh, you know, we've been very lucky in having um, partners who we can confide in, trust cases with, discuss with. And again, that's a very unusual situation when you have this many physicians in a group um, who get along so well. Yes. 
Jack, and, and don't forget, general urology is very important, too. That is a big part of the practice. And you were, no pun intended, Jack of all trades who could do many things. <laughs> yeah. And that is true. I mean, it's just that core general urology that feeds the subspecialization. And, and again, with, that's kind of what makes our group unique. And, and as we're recruiting these new ones, you know, we really want to try to see what what direction they're going, what really they like to do and how that fits into that, that whole puzzle. And it's a key thing. If we all had, you know, only docs who wanted to do right-sided, you know, par upper partial nephrectomies, I mean, it's, uh, it, it wouldn't work. So uh, we've been, we've been very fortunate with that too.